Hello everyone and welcome to Let's Communicate, Issues That Affect Family Life, a presentation of the West Orange Municipal Alliance. I'm your host, Paul Spahala. We thank you very much for joining us today. How much better would the world be if we could all just forgive each other every once in a while or forgive each other more often? Well, that's pretty much going to be the topic of our program today. We talk a lot about forgiveness and I'm very happy to uh, be joined today by Dr. Kenneth Silvestri. Dr. Silvestri, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be in, here. In general terms, uh, what is forgiveness and, and how often should we forgive people? <laughs> well, forgiveness is a word that I use that really helps people. Um, it's a process that helps people uh, do away with a grievance or pain that affects their life negatively. So I think it's a everyday process to forgive. And, and again, that will be uh, the, the main focus of our program today. I will once again introduce Dr. Kenneth Silvestri. We do thank you for being here with us today. Thanks. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your background. Well, I have a practice as a psychotherapist and I've been doing that for 25 years. And I'm also a certified classical homeopath. Uh, I studied anthropology. Uh, my, my doctor is actually in anthropology and psychology. And I studied at, at Columbia University and had the honor of studying with people like Margaret Mead and Paul Byers and you know, the real anthropologists. And that's part of how I got to look at families and culture and you know, how uh, you know, dealing with uh, life's actions help people you know, be able to smooth out their life. Uh, we are in such a, a fast-paced world, but especially right. here in, in the northeast part of, of America, uh, where it's such fast-paced, whether it's on the highway, when we go shopping, and especially at home, uh, we, we make enemies often, and maybe not even without knowing it as we drive down the highway, and, and right. we think we have enough uh, room to pass, but the person thinks we, we cut them off. Uh, bottom line is there are many opportunities to mm. forgive people. Why, when we don't forgive, does that affect us and how does that affect us? Well, one of the ways it affects us is that our nervous system has two parts. It has a, a revved up part, the fight or flight, which you need when you want to save your life and you're cut off in a car or something like that. And the calm part, uh, the big word is the parasympathetic, which is the calm part. The sympathetic is that revved up part. Unfortunately, uh, the fight or flight gets revved up over very minor instances, like for instance, trying to go to a, a parking space and, and not being able to find one in, uh, in a shopping market or something like that. I, I, uh, I always like look at the Whole Foods in my neighborhood where people try to get parking spaces and they're arguing and they're becoming very upset. Uh, the process is the same, unfortunately, as something as simple as not getting a parking spot and also, unfortunately, uh, losing a loved one or having a very you know, traumatic event. And what happens is that the, uh, the body gets revved up, the heart rate goes up, and uh, it affects cardiovascular, other, uh, other ailments. Uh, most, most ailments that you see people in the hospital with are from stress-related uh, ailments that come from uh, 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 carrying their fight or flight too often. And you bring up a good point, and, and again, I don't need, mean to make <laughs> light of the subject when we talk about losing a parking space or yeah. such, but, but you do mention a, a more intense situation, such as a, a death of a loved sure. one or, or, or divorce or separation. Right. When those type of really important events happen, uh, how, how do we need to explore ways to seek forgiveness and, and give forgiveness? Surely, it's a good question because you know, forgiveness is part of the, the mindful, you know, mindfulness uh, movement. And mindfulness is to keep yourself at a, a centered pace. Uh, and in many ways, you know, for every, the research that, uh, that's been done on forgiveness, and I'm indebted to Fred Luskin, who wrote a bestseller, Forgive for Good, uh, and he's at Stanford University and did many years of research. Uh, for instance, for every f uh, four minutes that you have a negative thought, your immune system is lowered for four hours. Consequently, as you ask the question, for every four minutes that you think positively, your immune system re becomes optimal and, and it works a lot better and hence uh, will rip, uh, fend off sicknesses and, and ailments. So I guess there's a, uh, a, a mind-body process to this, and which there is in the sense of being able to uh, really ask, what is your resiliency? I mean, how do you cope with the world saying no? I mean, it's, I don't know of anybody who does not uh, have pain in their life. We all have pain. And we can have that tale of woe <laughs> and develop that grievance uh, and have a hissy fit, you know, and deal with it forever. And as a psychotherapist, that's the thing that got me into forgiveness because a lot of people would come and go over this domain of misery and almost get used to it. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of psychotherapists will support that. Uh, but with forgiveness, you have to go one step beyond and to be able to center yourself 
get out of that fight or flight and into the calm part. And believe it or not, you could take five deep breaths, you know, soften your belly, breathe up, and think of something grateful. And all of a sudden, you're in that calm part. And that's where you should make your decisions. And that's where your solutions come to dealing with pain. Uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> many, many great athletes talk about that, that just take the deep breaths right. and, and calm down. It's right. interesting that you Phil live. Jackson has done that, and I think he's been in the finals uh, something like 12 <laughs> times over the last 15 years. So. It's interesting that you, you advocate <laughs> the, the same same type of approach uh, right. to, to forgiveness. Is it, is it, let, let's talk about me forgiving someone mm -hmm. and then me seeking forgiveness. Are, are, are they equally important? I think so. I think they're very equal. I mean, the first thing that one has to understand is that if you have pain, pain either coming from someone or pain that you might have inflicted on someone, uh, you have to recognize that that pain's in the present and it's happening right now. I mean, we could deal with pain that happened 20 years ago, but you know what? You can't change things that you can't change, that you have no power to change. And I call them uh, unenforceable rules. We could get stuck there forever and blaming, and all that activates that. Par uh, sympathetic part of your nervous system, which causes, again, havoc with your body. So I think that one of the ways that we could deal with that is to be able to c create a calming effect around us. I mean, it is a, a, having a be beginner's mind. You know, the Zen Buddhists say you should look at things, not judge things right away, take a deep breath, understand that you are in the present. Because most people who come for a psychotherapy or most people who are just really kind of revved up are not dealing with their primary grievance. They're dealing with secondary things like anger from it, and they're not going back into what it is that hurts them. So the first step is to really know what it is that you feel. And then the second step is to make a commitment to change. And another step, a following step, is again to recognize that there's unenforceable rules. Like I can't demand, uh, you can't demand a spouse not to cheat, you know, not to leave, or not to do this. But I could wish that. And when you're wishing something, your mind falls into a very calming effect, a, a calming process. Uh, so part of the process is that when you're breathing in and when you're breathing out is to think of something very grateful, something that you're compassionate about. In fact, I just I read a book recently, uh, it was called Born to be Good by a man named uh, uh, Dasher Keltner. And he's at Berkeley. And he's studying the vagus nerve, which is the largest nerve of that parasympathetic uh, part of our, our nervous system. And what he's found out is that that nerve only works at its optimal level when you're thinking of something compassionate. And when you're not, and that regulates your heartbeat, it regulates uh, your blood flow and circulatory system also. Uh, l let's bring in the, <laughs> the other area that, that you're involved with, homeopathy. What, what exactly is homeopathy? Well, homeopathy is a, a, a system of healing. It's the second most used um, medical system in the world uh, after, uh, I believe, Chinese herbal medicine according to the World Health Society. Uh, homeopathy was very prevalent, uh, especially in New Jersey. There was 21 hospitals that were homeopathic, Montclair Community, St. Mary's in Passaic, um, East Orange General. If you pass East Orange General and you look up, you'll see in the top East Orange Homeopathic General Hospital. And I, one out of two doctors in the West Orange, Montclair area up to maybe the 60s and early 70s were homeopaths. Homeopathy was developed by uh, Samuel Hahnemann, who uh, Hahnemann University was uh, named after. Uh, he was a German physician, and he used the concept of like cures like. Like, for instance, if uh, I do Aikido, which is a martial art, uh, a non-competitive but very uh, rigorous martial art, and a lot of times we get bruises and stuff. Uh, arnica, which most people know of because arnica is readily available even in King's supermarket, is a, a daisy, a mountain daisy. And if you get that mountain daisy and you put it on your tongue and it's full dose, you'll get bruises all over your body, like you've been hit by a truck, like myalgia. Uh, but if you do it in homeopathic form, well, it's all FDA regulated because it used to be in the hospitals and to this day it still is. Uh, the pharmacists are regulated, they water it down and that's, this is where it's poo-pooed because how could it exist while it's watered <laughs> down? But somehow the, the resonance uh, uh, stays in the imprint, a molecular imprint and with modern quantum physics and water research they're actually picking up the imprint. So arnica say is dissolved in distilled water, they impregnate these little pellets and if you take it when you have a bruise, it activates your immune system, almost like a little bit of a vaccination almost, but not exactly, and it allows the immune system to heal itself. It's interesting, a lot of things you're talking about are, <laughs> are uh, might fall under the category of, of new age, but as, yeah. you, as you said uh, recently, uh, homeopathy was a very popular form of, of 
medicine, mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a better term, uh, sure. from the early 1900s? Uh, from the, yes, during the Civil War time, you had uh, homeopaths that were physicians on both sides of the Confederacy and the, uh, the Union. Uh, up to this day, uh, to be a physician in, in Germany today, you still have to study homeopathy. Uh, uh, Germany, it prevalent France, it's very prevalent in Europe. In Europe. Yes, okay. it's prevalent in Europe, uh, possibly because of the pharmaceutical companies and the competition that we had here. The AMA, for instance, was formed to basically you know, put homeop homeopathy out of business. You know, during the uh, uh, early 20th century. I is it making a comeback here in the United States? It's making States? a big comeback. A lot of research now at Duke University comparing it like, for allergies, psycho uh, psychosomatic, uh, and even for, against psychotropic medications. It holds its own. As a, as a psychologist, I got involved because of seeing the secondary effects of uh, people uh, taking medication. I mentioned before that most people that are in hospitals are there. I think something like 60, 70 percent of uh, hospital ailments are uh, stress related and 70% are from secondary effects of uh, medication. And homeopathy is, uh, you have everything to gain, uh, you know, nothing to lose. There's 3,500 FDA regulated remedies. They've all been proven and researched. Uh, again, like cures like, healthy people will take the remedies. So it's hard to have a double bind study where you have an ill, Ill person. They, they test the remedies on healthy people. It elicits uh, certain symptoms and is codified. And if 50 people are, are in a trial taking a certain remedy, then uh, if 30 of them have a, uh, a form of depression or paranoia or something like that, it's put into the uh, FDA pharmacopoeia, and we could use that uh, to try to see if we could help people you know, with those ailments as a, an alternative. Doc so. Dr. Kenneth Silvestri <laughs> is, is our guest today here on Let's Communicate, Issues That Affect Family Life. We've been talking a, a lot about forgiveness and, and recently about homeopathy. We will go more in depth, especially into the forgiveness aspect of our, of our show today in a short moment. But right now we're going to take a very short break. You are watching Let's Communicate, Issues That Affect Family Life. This is a presentation of the West Orange Municipal Alliance. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Let's Communicate, Issues That Affect Family Life, a presentation of the West Orange Municipal Alliance. I'm Paul Spahala. We do thank you very much for being with us today. Our guest is Dr. Kenneth Silvestri. He is a psychotherapist and also a uh, homeopath. Uh, we will have been talking about forgiveness and homeopathy. Mm -hmm. How do the two work together? Well, for me, having being a student of uh, homeopathy and studied it for many years, uh, what I found is that forgiveness really helps uh, me determine remedies as well as sometimes looking at it from a homeopathic perspective it also helps me determine interventions for working with families and couples and I do a lot of work with uh, you know adolescents and families um, I guess you know every homeopathic remedy is, is has a, a goal to have your immune system both psychologically and physically uh, work at its best you know level and usually what happens is that there's a kind of a like a, a piercing or a hole or a, a hurt or a pain, and that's really what happens when there is a, a, an illness. Uh, so when I look at the you know forgiveness methodology, uh, a lot of times I ask people like, what is your you know what is what are you not getting in life? You know what is it that you're that you really wish you had? Because you know we all want things. We have a we're a society of entitlement, you know, and uh, and obviously people dwell on things and we rent too much space in our mind, and we ca it causes symptoms. Uh, I had a lot of people who uh, had breakups that were had ailments, uh, whether it be from uh, you know, muscular skeletal to uh, issues from Crohn's disease to whatnot. And a lot of times, you know, when I asked that initial question, like, "What is it that you're not getting?" You know, and it could be uh, affirmation, it could be nurturing, it could be a lot of different stories. And you know, as an anthropologist, I like listening to stories, and people have different stories. And homeopathy has a lot of remedies based on it's based on narrative, so you match the symptoms with the particular remedies that elicit those symptoms. And then all of a sudden, these, these particular remedies come up like with profiles. They're like people. You know, like phosphorus is a remedy, and the people who usually need phosphorus as a constitutional remedy are bubbly and, and effervescent, but they burn out quick, just like the phosphorus on a match. So these rem the minerals and uh, herbs uh, do replicate you know, who we are as people. 
What is the Center for Forgiveness Education? Well, the Center for Forgiveness Education is uh, set up uh, by myself, uh, Jed Rosen, who's a, a dear friend and colleague, a, a therapist in Ridgewood, and Fred Luskin, who wrote the book Forgive for Love out of Stanford University. And what we're doing is that we're training uh, people, lay people and professionals, I, I, uh, in the process of, of forgiveness, we also offer a certificate program, which is three weekends that we go out through the year. Uh, we're just completing our first year. We'll be completing, we'll be starting our, uh, our second, uh, 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 I guess, second uh, session uh, of uh, forgiveness tra training for certification in October. And, uh, but we also do a lot of uh, workshops with uh, organizations. Uh, Fred and, and Jed have been out in Hawaii training all state employees. Uh, we're working with police officers, we're working with senior citizen groups, with penal areas. Uh, so it's a, it's a good, it resonates with, uh, with just about everybody. And again, you know, how, how could you deny not having any, <laughs> any pain or grievances? At the end of our program, we'll have uh, both a phone number and a website where you can find more information uh, about Dr. Silvestri and about the uh, Center for Forgiveness mm -hmm. Education and also forgiveness workshops. What, what happens at a forgiveness workshop? Well, w one of the things that we like to do experiential things, and since it is a mind-body, you know, process, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll just start with the steps. You know, how is it that you form a grievance? You know, grievance is formed when you don't get something, and then you create a, a narrative, a story, where you become, the, for lack of a better word, the victim rather than the hero. So our goal is to allow people to become the hero. And one of the ways of getting out of a grievance is to not only get back into that parasympathetic, you know, nervous system, that calming part, you know, right in your belly, but also to deal with your positive intention. You know, I mean, in other words, what was your noble intent? You know, I mean, again, I mentioned before, like, you don't want your spouse to, uh, to leave you or you want your spouse to do something else. Uh, if you make a demand, obviously, you end up in that fight or flight. But if your noble intent was that you wanted to have a ha happiness or you wanted to have a, a real collaborative relationship, uh, when you work with your noble desire or your positive intent or your compassion, not only do you put yourself in the right state of mind, but you start making pro uh, problems go away. I mean, just solutions come readily. It's very difficult, you know, to be able to re resolve issues when you're, uh, when you're kind of flying high and you're not really you know, on the ground. So when you're centered, and you start looking at things in a holistic way. It's a very systemic form of uh, how nature works. You know, uh, 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 an anthropologist I studied with uh, years ago, Gregory Bateson, who at one time was married to Margaret Mead, he said all problems, uh, and, and a little data, he said all problems with mankind, I like to say all problems <laughs> with humans, uh, was, is a difference between how nature works and how we as humans think it works. And then within that gap, <laughs> you know, and we, you know, listen, the world says no. Uh, we, how do we deal with now? How do we t change like should have, should have to maybe and, you know, and I could have done this. You know, there's millions of people, billions of people without uh, fresh water in our country. 250,000 American children are, are in hunger, you know, in poverty. Uh, there's a lot of no out there. And I think that, you know, our world is that way. We're living in a very tense time. But, you know, if we could work with kids, uh, with uh, seniors, uh, uh, anybody to really start looking at what it is to soften yourself, you'd be surprised at how you view the world differently and how people get along better. Climates change. We, we'll do organizational healing with businesses or with schools and just to get people to be more cognizant of who they're with and what are the, you know, what is the, you know, Gandhi used to say you have to mitigate violence. There's no such thing as nonviolence. You know, he brought down a, an, em an empire, right. and uh, that was pretty violent to the British in their pocketbooks. <laughs> they were pretty pissed. You know, excuse me, but the truth is, is that you always go up to an encounter. I learned that in Aik Aikido. You know, we always go right up to the issue and try to resolve it in a collaborative way. Uh, you don't fight with anybody who has nothing to uh, lose, so hence, forgiveness isn't condoning, by the way, and I really should make that clear. It isn't minimizing hurt. It isn't like kissing up. Uh, it, it isn't sacrificing or losing your integrity. It's for you, and it goes and it relates to relationships. We work with forgiveness with couples. You know, we just published an article that's going to come out in the Psychotherapy Network on working with couples, and uh, we also have one in a, a, a magazine called Going Bonkers, which is self-help <laughs> with humor on forgiving your parents. You know, it's a whole process. We use a lot of visualization too. Uh, on, on the website, you will find, uh, among the is again, it's very interesting, but there's a, a survey that, uh, again, you can take, but obviously 
you know, you'll go through it with that person. Uh, th the reason I bring it up, there are very interesting questions. Uh, how do you react to being hot or cold? Uh, how do you deal with stress? How do you display your emotions, uh, 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 anger, jealousy? Uh, and then one or two other things like, how do you organize yourself and what bothers you about others? Right. And again, it's an interesting survey. And again, if you go on the website, you'll see all the questions. What does the knowledge that you gain from those answers well, that it, I may know, give you, how does that help you? Uh, I, a, a few years ago, I was down at uh, Seton Hall University and they were having a, a symposium on alternative medicine. And they had all kinds. They had you know, 20 different kinds from faith healing to massage and various things. And they had homeopathy. And I stayed there you know, very uh, attentively. And uh, they had the head MA, AMA, uh, uh, inquisit, in, in, inquisition type of person. I mean, he had charts and all kinds of stuff, and he was really, you know, disproving a lot of uh, uh, unscientific, you know, methods. Uh, when he came to homeopathy, he just kind of glanced over it. So I raised my hand and I said, "What about homeopathy?" And he goes, "Well, you know, we're tracking 30 people in, in uh, Upper New York State, and they're all getting better, and we're tracking 30 people in." Uh, uh, California are getting better. And I said, well, what do you think that is? He goes, well, you guys spend a lot more time with uh, the patient, maybe an hour. We only spend 10 minutes. Actually, it's 11 minutes by AMA standards. <laughs> well, we ask a lot of questions because the remedies are proven, and when they're proven, we ask things like, well, how do you rea react to hot? You know, how do you react to cold? Uh, re certain remedies are, have an affinity towards cold body of cold, a hot person, uh, food cravings. Uh, these remedies uh, will bring up a whole list of a whole lot of different things. Uh, the remedies will elicit uh, uh, feelings uh, and so there's different thoughts and dreams. We do a lot with dreams and, and uh, uh, you know, how people you know, uh, deal with life and how they cope. So the forgiveness methodology about what is not happening in their life gr brings up a core grievance. And also then I would start looking at, well, let me, now that I have that grievance, let me see if I can narrow it down and differentiate between maybe 50 remedies that come up. So each remedy is a, a profile. And, uh, and eventually it's like peeling the onion if you want to get to the, I don't know if you get a diamond in an onion, but <laughs> you, when you get down to that core and you polish it up, everybody has a constitutional remedy. Well, one of the other very interesting things, again, on, on the website, which we'll give you at the end of the program, the nine steps to forgiveness. And again, we don't have time to go through every step, but what, what are some of the more important of, of the nine steps well, to forgiveness? I think the most, when they're all important, but I of think course that, I, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, first of all, being aware of what it is, how you feel. But, you know, again, making a commitment to change, uh, then really practicing a mind-body, we call it uh, PERT. You know, which you know, really stands for really relaxing the, the belly and keeping a centered uh, exercise, like Qigong, you know, when you relax, and that's been proven over and over the years. And again, this is all research-based. You can go on, uh, on my website and Fred Luskin's res uh, website or read the book. But I think one of the most important ones is really refuting the, uh, uh, the unenforceable rules, getting away from blame, understanding that you can't make demands. And then uh, gradually, as you work with the positive intentions, like saying, well, you know, I, I want to be the hero. I don't want to be the victim. And you start seeing a difference. Uh, Fred has worked with uh, uh, mothers in Ireland who lost children through violence, sectarian violence. Uh, in Sierra Leone, he's worked. Uh, and, and each time has brought up not only health, but more peace where people could forgive. Again, not minimizing. Uh, the last step, I think, is extremely important. It's a life well lived. A men your grievance story. So if you're saying like, you know, I just feel like you know, everybody's picking on me all the time, nobody likes me, you know, that last, that last amendment is that I'm going to go out there in the world and, and, and make some positive, uh, I'm going to have positive attributes, I'm going to be likable. Um, forgiveness is a practice that has emerged from the teachings of all the major religious traditions. So it, it's not a religious experience, it's not, no. it's not but, but it has borrowings from sure many major religions. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a little different. Like I know uh, Fred tells me in the Jewish religion that if you ask someone for forgiveness three times, they have to forgive you. <laughs> uh, but obviously in Judaism, it's a beautiful, wonderful way of, of being humanistic. Uh, in Islam, there's humanism. Uh, in Christianity, there's mystical humanism. Uh, however, we don't institutionalize it. We're talking about how it is to be human <laughs> and to be able to get along, to be able to have good relationships, to be healthy, and to make the world a better place. And uh, you know, the research says that when people are in a forgiving mode and their mind and body is balanced and their immune system is working, uh, a lot of issues seem to go to the wayside. If I <laughs> try to forgive someone and they don't accept that forgiveness, have I at least made myself 
feel better? Uh, what what yeah. happens when I'm rebuffed in my attempt to that's forgive great, someone that's a great who, question. Who, has, who I feel yeah. has wronged me? It's a great question. And again, like in Aikido, you say don't fight with anybody who has nothing to lose. Okay. Uh, however, it's for you. That's the interesting thing. Forgiveness is for you. It'll, it'll spill over on the other person. It, there's a re residual you know, pickup, being assertive, you know, collaborating and stuff like that. But it really is for you. The change comes from within ourselves and how we then relate to the world. Uh, there's also self-forgiveness. I mean, we have to forgive ourselves, too, for injuring someone or maybe doing something that's harmful. Uh, you know, again, making amends. But you know, the basic thing is it's, it's, it's a word that we use to bring peace and happiness. And, uh, and, and also a, f a physical mind-body, you know, uh, wellness. So it really helps to, uh, you know, say, hey, I'm, I tried. You know, I, I might have tried. Uh, the world says no. I can't make a demand, but I have a wish that, that you would forgive me. Yeah. Very good. A as I said at the very end of our program, which unfortunately we are approaching, it has been a very interesting show today. Uh, we'll have uh, a, both a phone number and a website where you can find out more information uh, about Dr. Silvestri and about some of the things that we talked about tonight. With a with a final comment, Ken, uh, what what what? How could you leave our audience with a, a positive thought uh, about forgiveness? Well, a positive thought, geez, uh, you know, I think that when you're uh, dealing with the, the doldrums of the world, you know, and you think that you're getting into a you know a rut, uh, in many ways you have to kind of celebrate. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the uh, famous Vietnamese Buddhist monk, uh, his first book on mindfulness was uh, you know how to enjoy washing dishes, you know how to be grateful for the fact is you probe. You know, sometimes uh, I have people come into my office and they'll say, I'm really, I feel lousy today. And I'll say, well, there, did there anything grateful happen? And they'll say, no. And I said, well, did you have breakfast? You know, yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. Well, who made the, uh, you know, who grew the crops or something? You go, you keep on going until you find something that, that makes you grateful. And all of a sudden, you activate that vagus nerve. And, uh, you know, they, they say that our president now is a, a super vagus person because he's so kind and, and empathic. And uh, so we need more people like that. So right. everybody join the, you know, the forgiveness uh, process. Well, <laughs> it, it, it sounds like a great, uh, great idea, and it sounds very interesting. As I said, at the end of our program, you will find a phone number and a website. I do not have to forgive you <laughs> because this uh, has been uh, certainly one of the most interesting shows we've done. Oh, Ken, thank you thank so you much, Paul. Much. I, I appreciate, appreciate it. you being with us today. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, information available at the end of our program. We do thank you all for being with us today. Uh, let's communicate issues that affect family life. As always, a presentation of the West Orange Municipal Alliance. I'm Paul Spahala. We again thank you all for being with us. We hope to see you again for more of Let's Communicate. Good night.